Welcome to this little video. I wanted to talk about a topic which is very, very close to my heart. Um, since the early 2000s I became interested in the topic and that is Maori weaponry or Maurakao. Maybe you saw already in my channel that sometimes I use the term Maurakao or Rakao, um, which is Maori weaponry. And this is a topic that is very close to my heart since the early 2000s when I became first interested in Maori martial arts and Maori weaponry. Um, so today I want to give you a little introduction about the weapon types um, that are used or were used and also about uh, how to apply the techniques a little bit. So it's not really a how-to video, but I will show you at least a little bit. Luckily, uh, after about 20 years of research on my own, you know, just trying to pick up things, pick up stuff um, over the internet, over YouTube and, and you know, try to understand how Maori weaponry works, um, just out of curiosity and respect for Maori history and culture. And um, luckily I found someone in New Zealand who is a real Maori cow instructor and who gives me not only tons of advices and you know, shows uh, excellent videos, um, he also gave me a, a lot of links towards uh, historical sources uh, because of course the Maori did have an oral tradition to transfer knowledge from generation to generation uh, but there are history books um, from the 19th century from the early 20th century which describe Maori warfare weaponry stories of combat um, uh, you know legends of heroes and things like that where you can learn already a lot about the application of the techniques and when you then compare it to what was transferred over the, over the time uh, in the different parts of New, New Zealand in the different Iwi, different Maori tribes, um, then you can get a really good picture. Luckily, uh, after about 20 years of research on my own, you know, just trying to pick up things, pick up stuff um, over the internet, over YouTube and, and you know, try to understand how Maori weaponry works, um, just out of curiosity, and respect for Maori history and culture and um, luckily I found someone in New Zealand who is a real Maori cow instructor and who gives me not only tons of advices and you know shows uh, excellent videos um, he also gave me a, a lot of links towards uh, historical sources uh, because of course the Maori did have an oral tradition to transfer knowledge from generation to generation uh, but there are history books um, from the 19th century, from the early 20th century, which describe Maori warfare, weaponry, stories of combat, um, uh, you know, legends of heroes and things like that, where you can learn already a lot about the application of the techniques and when you then compare it to what was transferred over the, over the time uh, in the different parts of New, New Zealand, in the different Iwi, different Maori tribes, um, then you can get a really good picture. Most people know Maura Kau uh, from theatrical displays or from stage performances and these are really uh, awesome and, and great to watch. There are also instructors who still teach Maura Kau as a combat art. So next to the forms or traditional performances they show martial application, do sparring and train Maura Kau really as a, a martial art, as a combat form, as a form of combat. And that is really interesting, that is what interests me the most, the martial application, the real use of all these cool Maori weapons, because like many other um, people in Polynesian world, uh, the Maori had a lot of very cool, interesting weapons made out of hardwood, uh, whalebone, greenstone and also greystone or basalt, I think. Um, and I just, you know, got hooked. I love swords, but I also love wooden weapons, and I got hooked by these Maori weapons quite soon in the early 2000s. And um, I will show you a little bit what I know so far about them. This information is, you know, to my best knowledge, so maybe I get some things wrong. And I want to thank my uh, Maori cow instructor in New Zealand, who gave me all this information and knowledge. Uh, and I can, you know, can't wait. Very much looking forward to training with him in person um, in, in the future. When it comes to Maori weapons, you really have to keep in mind that you have to think about the context and the circumstances of Maori warfare. Um, first of all, the environment is pretty important. You have New Zealand with really dense forests uh, um, and uh, you know, also mountains and hills 
and Maori warfare was generally not uh, too much of open battle with big masses. This was more about ambushes and guerrilla tactics, but also um, siege tactics because Maori were uh, great in building fortifications, wooden palisades and wooden fortresses or fortified villages uh, called a pa, and these were really excellent, um, excellent fortress construction. So Maori had also think a lot about how to invade such a Maori power with the weapons they used. And Maori weaponry was very much about hand-to-hand -hand combat. So Maoris had projectile weapons, um, like uh, throwing spears and, and uh, throwing javelins, which were also you know, like propelled and given more power, speed and accuracy uh, with a similar throwing device like the uh, atalatl. Besides that, um, bow and arrow were, was not really their weapon, so they were more about hand-to-hand -hand combat. And therefore, um, you know, raids, ambushes, attacks, and also the environment of a very dense and probably dark forest, you have to keep that in mind. Um, the other thing was next to warfare, duels. So duels of honor, which could go to the first blood, but also to the death. So, uh, sometimes uh, it was about an insult, sometimes it was a duel about, um, uh, about, uh, um, about land, um, sometimes it was just a show of strength between the fierce warriors of, of each tribe, of uh, rivaling tribes, and uh, or also the chiefs or chieftains they met and they fought um, uh, uh, instead of having a battle. And these duels could go to first blood or even to death, so there could be also um, various rounds of different weapons uh, which they face, so like first going for long range weapons and short range, we range weapons and so on. But even though the Maori were very quick with, with adapting firearms in their tactics during the musket wars within the early 19th century, they still used hand to hand combat a lot, especially because of the guerrilla tactics they were using um, also against the British forces, against the colonial forces later. Um, so, hand to hand combat was never unimportant in Maori warfare, even when they adopted firearms. So the first family of weapons is two-handed weapons. So weapons you generally hold with two hands, you could say pole arms or uh, staff weapons, and these are generally used with two hands and have of course a longer reach. The other family is short-range weapons, so these like more one-handed, uh, so you use them more one-handed, and these are one-handed shorter weapons for close quarter combat. Um, these are, generally speaking, the two families. Within the first family, so the long-range weapons, the most popular many people know from these uh, theatrical stage performances is this one here, the Tiger Heart. However, I will not talk about this first. I will talk about another weapon first. The weapon I will talk about first is the Maori spear, because spears were much more important in warfare and in combat uh, than other weapons. Um, as all over the world, the spear was relatively easy to make. Um, you could make it in, in you know, like you know, big masses. You could store them within the pa uh, to have them ready in case of an attack. Um, and you could carve them from a piece of hardwood, or you would just take a good solid um, piece of manuka wood, and you would uh, sharpen the point and fire harden the point. And there you go. You have an excellent weapon and a deadly spear. And spears came in different sizes and shapes. I will talk about two which were quite common in more like personal combat and also in more confined spaces. And the first one is the Tao, which is a spear with only one point, and the other is a Koi Koi with uh, two points. So you have such a fire hardened, very nasty point uh, on both sides of the staff. This one used to be a koi koi, but I turned this into a uh, hiking. And this is made by Andrew Dudesheim, uh, Irish she ladies right valley. It's not manuka wood, it's black thorn. Um, and I put a cap down here because I turned this, and I have also here a loop, so I turned this into my hiking towel. So this is like a hiking set, but it's a towel. Um, and that was also something which was kind of usu uh, you know, usual. Uh, when you were going on, on a hike on a longer journey and you need like a walking support, a walking aid uh, because of the rough terrain, but you also have a solid weapon ready. So this is like you could say the little bit shortened version of hiking towel as you could say it. 
So tau has one point, koi koi has two points, one on each end. This could be like, you know, this height of a man, or a little bit longer, or a little bit shorter, depending on the circumstances. There were also quite long spears, which were used to attack and to defend, uh, um, to defend the power. But generally speaking, for personal combat, or like in these ambushes and raids, when you would be uh, in the forest or in, in, you know, in the enclosed environment of uh, a Maori fortress, you would use something which has maybe your height or a little bit shorter. So it takes this bow stuff as a replacement to just show some of the techniques. So generally speaking, you have like two typical grips or three, um, like a typical uh, spear grip with long range grip. Um, uh, where you can do parries and thrusts. Uh, you can also do strikes from here. Of course, the koi koi or tao is not made for striking. You can strike with it, but the power lies within the thrust. Um, however, it is a long step, so obviously you can whack someone with that in the head, break fingers and bones and whatnot. But from here you would do parries and thrusts and maybe some striking as well. And that would be a typical long range. You could stand left foot forward, right foot forward, it doesn't matter. The second guard, which is very important, is more like this retracted guard. So you hold a little bit like in Japanese swordsmanship, a hustle no kamai, something like that. And from here, of course, you can go for parry and a thrust. You can go for strike and a thrust. You can also use the other end to parry here on your low line, on your inside. You can also parry here on your high line. And from here, you can very well do thrusts forward with the other end. So this is a very good example why a koi koi, so a spear with two points, is a very good idea. Because with a koi koi, you can go here, have one point, can go back, have the second point, okay? And this is quite typical from here, these quick thrusting motions, you can go with your front hand, so you have more precision, or you can go with your rear hand for more reach, okay? And generally, you would try to go for the softer region, regions of the body of the opponent. So, this is a very typical position, and if you imagine you have a dense forest, which is a little bit dark, it's really hard to really judge the length of the spear uh, you are facing. Um, so, Koi Koi and Tao, the power lies in the thrust, but of course you can also uh, do some hits with that. The second long-range weapon I want to show you, as I said, is probably the most popular one. That's the Tairaha. Uh, the Tairaha is quite unique because it is somewhere between a two-handed wooden club or wooden uh, cudgel. It is like a wooden sword and it's also like a spear. So it's a Tairaha, it's something on its own. You can strike with it, as you can see, the uh, Tayaha is quite flat and broad here in the upper third and you have a sharp striking edge. So of course you cannot really cut with that like with a knife but of course if you get that hard on your fingers, on your bones, on your head this gives you pretty brutal uh, damage, broken bones and whatnot. And of course you have the point here could be in various shapes, sometimes rounder, sometimes a little bit more 
uh, edgy like this one, but of course you can also thrust with that point. Uh, in the middle you have more like an oval shape, more round, just you know, turns to be a little bit more round here. This is where you hold your tire arm and down here you have what is called the tunnel. Also this comes in different sizes and shapes, but generally speaking it should be also sharp and pointy because that is to finish your opponent when it's on the ground uh, or in close quarters as well. Okay, so similar like the butt strike of, uh, of a bayonet, you would use this to thrust forward. So the same thrust like you can do with the koi koi or with the towel, you can do with the uh, tire as well. But of course, at the uh, best um, attribute of the koi koi and towel is the thrust. The strength in the tire ha is of course the sharp and quick cut. And you don't do like massive swings with it, okay? First of all, you don't have the space. Second, you don't need to do that to inflict damage. And also you have more control. So you use like very sharp striking. You have all parries, different parries, where your hand is protected and where you can go through the different guards. And you have a lot of nice sharp strikes. And also, what I find interesting, a lot of things, especially in Satire, remind me of backsword fencing or saber fencing, because also Japanese kendo, which I did for 10 years, because you have like high faint low line attack to the ribs, yeah, or you have high faint to the head, you hold down for the thrust. So, I really like the Taiha for being. Uh, kind of a mix of swordsmanship and spear fighting or bayonet fencing or something like that. Um, so yes, as I said, the Taiha might be the most popular weapon amongst the Maori weapons. There are a lot of different other two-handed weapons or long weapons. And you would use that in warfare as well. Um, it's not so to speak that the spear was uh, uh, only for warfare and the Taiha was only for you. No, so of course you would also use a Taiha in warfare, I just wanted to point out that the spear, uh, which doesn't get uh, too much credit on the stage today in our cow performances, the spear was way more important for warfare for the greater mass of Maori warriors than the tire arms. But the tire arms, of course, you would also take with you into battle. Yeah? But it's also, of course, an excellent dual weapon. You could say it's a little bit like the pole arms of the medieval times, like halberd and pike and whatnot, and the longsword, and the same is here. You have the tau and koi koi and the other spears, and then you have the taiaha, uh, which is kind of the Maori sword. Um, there are also some excellent accounts for the use of both weapons in warfare and in duel.
Ja, das ist bitte das Ende.